The following interview was conducted with Kim Kameen for the Purdue University Libraries. It took place on July 30th, 2015 at her office in Cary Quadrangle. The interviewer is Renee Gorder. Thank you for agreeing to, to interview with me today. You're welcome. So um, what brought you to Purdue? When did you first come to Purdue and what brought you here? I came here uh, uh, back, we lived in Rossville, Indiana, so knew of Purdue and came back here because my husband used to work here when he was in high school and he wanted to get a job at Purdue and he did and uh, I was working elsewhere and it wasn't a, a good fit, not a real people place and I'm a people person. So I started applying and had an interview and came in for the interview, got hired uh, by the time I got home and started work on that following Monday. Okay. And that was back in October of 78. So then were you from Rossville? Have you, have you lived there your whole life? Not my whole life, originally from Norfolk, Virginia. Okay. And then due to unfortunate circumstances of a uh, loss of an entire family, my dad's entire family, uh, we moved to Rossville and he picked up the family welding business. And um, then I just started school there from the second grade on. Nice. So. so what was it like growing up in in Indiana. in Indiana. Do you remember much of the difference between Virginia and Indiana? Oh, I certainly do. I remember when I came here, I had an accent. <laughs> and I got teased, and I learned quickly to adapt and get the Hoosier accent <laughs> instead of the Southern accent. But I met some really great kids in my class. There was only about 45 of us. And believe it or not, you know, we're going to be celebrating 40, 40th uh, high school reunion, and we're all still friends. Okay. And there are five of us that have remained very close all those years. And we've been together through loss and happiness and ch childbirth and everything. So. so I know that you've had various positions at mm -hmm. Purdue. Can you tell me a little bit about where you started and then your different positions? And through my, the, the directory lists you as the housing business process analyst. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so that's your current job. So mm -hmm. if you could walk me from where you started up to now. Sure. In 78, I, um, in those days, uh, women predominantly took the typing test, and then whatever position you could get into, you took it, and then Purdue had a great uh, uh, way of moving you around to other positions once you got your foot in the door. And so the first job I had was actually as uh, a, one of the cooks in Owen Hall. Got to know the students. They were all my age. We were all young and enjoyed that. And then when the school year ended, I had the option of going to another hall where they were serving food for the summer or staying there and working on the service crew. And I liked challenges so I said I'm gonna stay with my friends and work on the service crew so I learned how the proper way to paint uh, many things that summer as well as cooking uh, too and then in that uh, fall the clerk who was in the main office at Owen took another position at Cary Quadrangle I applied for it and uh, I got that that position and so when I started at Owen as a clerk it was an all men's residence hall and I think it was a couple of years later, the women that lived in Terry Courts, which is no longer there, but the Terry House is there with Purdue Police, um, they decided there wasn't any housing for women on the north side, so they started a petition for somebody to do something, and they did, and it was our hall, Owen, and we went half co-ed, or half women, half men, mm -hmm. we went co-ed. And it was kind of funny because, you know, the women petitioned. We thought we would end up filled with Terry Quartz women. Mm -hmm. And actually, we were filled with more women from other halls than we were from Terry. <laughs> so it was kind of a neat dynamic. But I saw it go from, um, I'll just say it, burps and <laughs> oh my's to uh -huh. very uh, uh, genteel behavior once we became co-ed, which was <laughs> funny. And we, uh, we, our hall was also responsible for seven of the buildings at that time that were Ross 8 apartments. And uh, they were all men apartments. They had been a part of married student housing. And to the left of them up on the hill was, was married student housing. And so over the course of time that I was there at Owen, I saw that transition to where we took on all those apartments. And, um, uh, 
I was a clerk three at the time at Owen and a head secretary, which is what they called that position at the time. That opened up at Earhart Hall and I applied for it and got that job. And so when I started over there, which was great because I was still within the family mm -hmm. and everybody knew each other and they were great at saying, we're glad you're promoted, we want you to do better. Um, but while I was there, it was interesting because it was all women. So I went mm -hmm. from men to co-ed to all women. Mm -hmm. And in a way, it was like a big sorority, and I still have lifelong friends, more so from Earhart and a few from Owen, so I think that's really a great experience. But while I was at Earhart, um, we got the first computers. Oh, okay. So, you know, I feel really old in saying <laughs> this, but we got computers, and so everybody's all of a sudden worried we're going to lose our jobs. Mm -hmm. But those were the days when you turned it on and you had to make it all work. Mm -hmm. So I took a lot of classes at Purdue learning how to use the computer, the, my, uh, the software at the time, which was WordStar. And we just started from there, just light, light speed going forward mm -hmm. with technology. And that seemed to be where I was more comfortable. So then when a position opened up in our director's office, which would have been a lateral move, um, the lady who became my supervisor said, why don't you come over here? Technology's advancing a little mm -hmm. bit more, maybe you would like it. Yeah. So I did, and I applied for the position like anyone else, and uh, they went ahead and gave me the position, and I missed the students. First thing I first experienced was homesickness, missing the students. And um, some of them came over to see me, which mm -hmm. really meant a lot. But over time, I replaced the students with the staff. And uh, technology kept evolving. And we started using dumb terminals, which was you just keyed in the number, and it brought you back the data, but you couldn't do anything with it. And from there, it evolved even more to when my boss then, her husband was a Purdue student, he graduated and they left. Uh, I applied for her position and got that. So moved up the ladder again, and then started in hyperdrive with technology. And we used DBase 3. Uh, we used, um, which was scary to the clerks in the halls. So we did a lot of the work for them. Uh, and then uh, we went from that to a homegrown system, and that worked for a short time. Then we went to another one, and a whole team of us came together to try and make that one work with the mainframe system. And then we've just evolved from there to now housing online mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, for us and students, and it's just been phenomenal to go through all those changes and see them and to still have friendships with students who they weren't techie either mm -hmm. at the time. So then um, ITEP went through a reorganization and at the time uh, my current supervisor, or my supervisor at that time, he and I were the two in charge of the new housing system that was online and sat on people's computers um, at their desk. And ITAP went through a reorganization and they took him and um, I was told that if they took me they were going to riff my position but my boss, um, our boss's boss went to bat for me and they put me in a different job which is now the housing business process mm -hmm. analyst uh, and kept me on the operations side but before that I was a systems administrator so I have every gratitude to, to shower on university residences for helping me grow from a cook mm -hmm. all the way up to now I coordinate and um, am in charge of a lot of things um, not just the computer but in a lot of other processes too. So can we talk a little bit about what you do in your current position as the business process analyst? Sure um, what I do is I study the housing system this is one role. I study the housing system. I learn the best way to um, enter the processes based on time management skills, the least amount of clicks, uh, what it takes for our staff to have word association with the icons and the pictures, and then I write up the instructions for that and then train them. And the instructions, usually when you write a manual, it's something that you read. Or you might get lucky and have one that's got a lot of pictures in it. 
but our staff uh, at the Central Assignments Office are just techy enough that they say, could you just tell us what we're supposed to do? So that's how their instructions have been written, and then I continue to train them on those. So that's kind of my role for them, and then my role for our hall staff is to train new people on how to use that housing system and look people up because they have different processing from making assignments. So um, I train them, get them uh, instructions that help them uh, be successful, and I try to write them in a way that it's as though they've got me sitting right beside them. And uh, so I do that, and then uh, I can also train on Microsoft Office, Excel, and Outlook, and usually someone will want something advanced done, and so I have to Google and research and learn that or a PDF document that helps with a form they want filled out. So my, my role is almost IT, but still operational, uh, which gives me the freedom to still do what I did as a systems administrator, just not have all the access. And then along with this role, I also am responsible for our doors in the residence halls so that when new student staff or full-time staff need door access to where they're employed, um, I help coordinate getting them that access through our SharePoint site and keeping that up to date. And then um, right now I'm coordinating for all of our halls, all of our dining courts, inclusive of the union, several departments on campus that are all going to have students that need to come back earlier than our normal traditional early arrival period to work or to help with check-in, help our new students coming in. So I'm gathering the data for all of that and then I'll send it to the card office so these students have employment doors, residential doors, and that they also have a gap meal plan. And the gap meal plan is what we give them until their contracted meal plan starts on the first day of their contract. So um, I'm responsible for training a coworker on how to use the same system, um, our night access clerks on how to monitor our doors if we have a shelter in place situation or, or inclement weather, something is wrong. Um, my responsibility 24-7 is to make snap decisions on what do we need to do so students can get in. What do we need to do to keep someone out? Um, and um, I just like doing that. <laughs> so. so so then I am not as, as techy as maybe I should be. <laughs> I feel so old all the time. Uh, I, there's other students that just know how to do so much more. Yeah. But what all, I guess, what all is involved with um, with housing? You, you mentioned the doors. Like what all, what all is is coordinated yeah I um, I use starting from if we're looking at students and their housing needs or student employees so if if they're a student they're in our star res housing system and we have an automatic process to give them doors and meals when their contract starts but out of that population as well as students off campus or who live in fraternities sororities co-op housing if they work for us uh, which we're grateful when they do. Um, their supervisors want to make sure that they have those residential doors earlier than the contract date. So I work with our IT department to make sure that they're reprogramming our file to send to the Blackboard system early access for residential doors. And then I use um, Excel. I put about 20 spreadsheets out there for all the various different, well, no, I want to say about 40 spreadsheets <laughs> actually because there's dining involved out there for each of the administrators to access or the clerks to access and update and tell me who is coming back that's working for you that needs doors and, and meals. And then they're counting on me to take that information and transmit it to the Blackboard system through SharePoint and then to follow up and make sure everybody's got what they need and if they don't to troubleshoot that. And Today, for instance, I'm working on the first uh, master document of because we gave them a Monday deadline, but we're going to have more after. So it's continuing to stay on top of things to make sure our students have everything they need when they come back. So does Blackboard do more than just courses? It mm -hmm. okay. 
Yeah, it's kind of neat. Um, I think there's a, a whole system blackboard that's just all academic area. And then what we work with is um, like if you have an ID card uh, or any student comes here and an employee gets an ID card that's made at the card office over in Hubdy Hall. And that's in that system for doors and meals. Um, and they gather information on employment, um, housing assignments, and, and things like that. And they put that in their system based on the data that we all send to them. And that puts on their student's card their doors for employment, their doors for their residence. Some cases they may work up to like six or seven locations on campus. And in housing, we'll have, we have neighborhoods. So we may have a group of students who are actually needing door access for four or five of our buildings at one time. Others may only need one. So it's coordinating what their needs are for that and, and assigning it. And then I can actually go into the Blackboard system and manually input data as well as far as doors and meals. Another part of that is training our facility staff because um, they schedule our doors just, you know, so that when we're all closed, the doors are all controlled. You can only come in if you're supposed to. So I train the facility staff on how to schedule their doors, uh, which they're starting to gear up for check-in mm -hmm. for BGR, BGRI, and uh, they've been calling me and <coughs> wanting me to double-check their work. Mm -hmm. And um, then I also refresh the doors so that when they put those schedules in the system, you've got to tell the system there's new schedules. Mm -hmm. So we do a refresh once a week during the summer because we have camps and conferences, yeah. and that resets the doors accordingly. And there's times where of an evening if a camp or conference has had a, got caught in a traffic jam or something and our doors are controlled and they can't get in because their card is inside mm -hmm. that building, um, I'll get a call and I'll get asked to go ahead and just totally unlock the door so they can just walk right in. Otherwise, it's controlled with card access. You probably gave my card access when I was working at Woodson years I, ago. Yes, I did. So, I'm sure. And I got a meal plan. It was a pretty sweet deal. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what do you find most challenging and then also most rewarding about your position? Um, I think what's most challenging sometimes is the communication because I don't think people realize how big university residence is, is here on this campus. And uh, sometimes it's information overload. Sometimes people aren't told things or we sometimes have siloed things going on and, and um, you know, makes it a little difficult. And I know people get kind of, now we're in the tech world, people get tired of email. Those used to be phone calls. Those used to be meetings with memos and taking notes and everything. And so it's, it's a challenge in that respect to make sure that you are communicating. If, for instance, one year we had a blizzard here over winter break. Our students started coming back, and the doors, the doors were unfortunately not open when they were supposed to be. There was a little glitch in the Blackboard system. And so once we, I started getting calls, you know, then you're monitoring that situation to see who's trying, and then you click the door so they can get in ahead, you know, so they hear it click and they can get in. So it's communication of, of things like that because it was after hours, you know, we, I, I tried to call people, I couldn't reach them, and you just do what you can. So I think that might be the biggest issue because we are so big. Um, another another thing, uh, not necessarily personally for me, but our dining and service staff are just top notch, and I wish they could get paid more. Because I've been to other schools, and I walk down a hallway, and I don't see the floor shine like they do here, or, or it's just little things. You know, the campus doesn't look as nice, and you come here, and it's it's exciting. I think, and I think what is probably the best thing about it was when my husband has passed away, he passed in 2004 to cancer, but he worked for the grounds department, he was a crew chief, he loved what he did, loved helping make this campus look beautiful, and they honored him with a tree. Oh, really? And that meant the world to me that the university cared that much to honor him with a tree and a plaque, 
and his family over there and my family in university residences came together at a difficult time mm -hmm. and built a ramp for Larry because he was six foot four mm -hmm. and it was very difficult to get in the house. So his people built the ramp. My people over here, they brought food. And where do you get that? I mean, yeah. it's a huge, huge organization, but they touched us on such a personal level and that happens all the time that people don't know about. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned after hours and things. Do you get a lot of calls like at home? Are you having to kind of sign in and give people access it's, remotely? Or? It's rare. Um, it's just if there happens to be an issue or like I said, a conference bus is caught in mm -hmm. traffic, comes late, inclement weather could cause you to be more on call of an evening. Um, during the school year, no, because we have staff who are monitoring on third shift and, and help out in that respect. But during the summer, um, probably a little bit more than in the fall. So. I never realized how integrated everything, everything mm -hmm. was. It is, yeah. We're, with the card office, before it existed, um, uh, we took pictures in the halls, <laughs> you know, and made our IDs in the halls. And then they started evolving, and now they are the card office. And so it's great that we interact with them. We interact with um, conferences, um, Purdue uh, Fire Department, police. They help us during check-in mm -hmm. time. So, uh, and parking services. We are all interconnected. So, it seems like you'd be busy all year. But are, I mean, is beginning of semester and end of semester some of the busiest times? Or what do you, what do you think is the busiest? The busiest time is when we, it has been in the past, like when we hit February and we get to maybe the end of August and we have a little lull. And then in uh, November, we're getting ready for winter break and getting ready for check-in. And then we have a little lull in January. But this year, the admissions office decided, decided to go back to a concept they did years ago when, um, during my course of being here of where they're going to admit students earlier. So because everything's on uh, electronic, uh, you have to program systems to run simultaneously for the current as well as the future. So we're going to be busier. We've been busy since around February and we probably will now be nonstop until <laughs> January and maybe have a little break in there because of the earlier admits. It's well, going to be different this year. Never a dull moment. No, <laughs> no, I, that's why I love it though. It's, it's not and, and uh, you just meet every challenge head on. You know you're helping your students and your staff and you just feel, have, feel fulfilled. You feel fulfilled. <laughs> So. Um, so how, and you've been at the residence halls since the late 70s, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you feel that the residence halls have changed over time? Um, in some ways, uh, when I started, and especially in the 80s, the clubs were a little more active. They had dinner dances. They had big parties. And it was maybe a little bit more interaction with bigger groups. Mm -hmm. You saw groups of students go to the dining uh, dining room. In those days, we had um, dining in every hall, um, and you, and you would see that happening. Just afraid it's a, it's a little louder. <laughs> yeah, if you want to stop it. Um, it's okay. Okay, um, that dynamic changed when they stopped doing that as much, and the more the computers came online, and um, so I, I think that. Um, Students are still active. I love when they have the dock dances and stuff like that. But it's it's not quite the same as it was in those days with bigger group interaction. And I know that they're working with learning communities. You know, you have a group of students clustered together. But you don't really see that because they're clustered together there and maybe in a room somewhere in the building or in a, another location. So that's probably one of the biggest changes. And then going to the five dining ports and having dining. Um, I thought at first, you know, being a little bit old school, that might be kind of rough, you know, and we heard a lot from, you know, our parents that had gone here and stuff, but actually when you go to the dining courts and you, you still see clusters of students mm -hmm. together, it's really great. So, um, 
it's just different. Yeah. It's a different way of looking at it today. Well, and they have the little, I know at least in Windsor, they have the little kind of quickie mart, like mm-hmm. on the go, thing, on the go, which is nice because I feel like students are so, so overly scheduled that it, sometimes they can't make it. it. It's very true. And that's one of the concerns parents had before we started on the go was you've got five locations. What if they you have a class when you're serving and they have you know really great expanded uh, hours of service but when they started on the go that was really great because you you know we could tell parents you don't have to worry they can get food there Mm -hmm. and and you can understand that from parents who went to Purdue and had a dining Mm -hmm. you know in their building and and now it's like not a big deal at all anymore and I'll never forget when I worked over at Smalley uh, as an applications clerk, uh, we had a mom come in and she said, she did this and I thought it was really sweet because she did it in a wonderful way instead of a mean way. Her son was going to be in McCutcheon Hall, which is the furthest hall away from main campus. Mm-hmm. She came back in and she was drinking some water and kind of cooling down. There's another family there who their child was assigned to McCutcheon. And, and I shouldn't say child, but they're, <laughs> you're, they're uh, I can't remember if it was a boy or girl, but anyways, that's even young too. But anyways, um, they were like, oh my gosh, how are we ever gonna make it? She said, I just put them to the test and walking, just a nice walk, it only took me 10 minutes to get to main campus. And there she was helping me, helping another parent who was concerned And so I was able to use that example from that point forward. And then they started on campus the free bus service if you show your ID. And uh, University Residences was behind that in the beginning and I'm so happy they did that. Because when the weather's bad, Mm -hmm. the last thing you want is mom and dad worried at home because they see we have an ice storm or Mm -hmm. something. How are they getting to class? Yeah, Yeah, that bus is nice. I. especially when I was pregnant and it was snowy and I had to park in the discovery oh. lot and I could just get on the bus and ride mm-hmm. instead of having to waddle. Oh, yeah. Oh, bless your heart. But, yeah, I mean, that was really great. And then when they opened it up to staff, too, and anywhere in the West Lafayette, Lafayette, Twin mm-hmm. City area, that was wonderful. And it helped our staff because we actually had, to, uh, I had a really good friend. He's since passed away, but... Uh, I I mentioned him because I knew Randy when he was a student in Owen and I was a cook and he decided he liked Purdue and he wanted to stay here so he ended up being a clerk in one of the halls kind of helping manage it. He's since passed away but he rode the bus everywhere and he said why not? Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's free. (laughs) So So you mentioned um, doing some, some classes and training for um, starting with the, the IT and the computers. Have you gotten a degree from Purdue or have you done a continuing education classes? I feel like I have a degree from <laughs> Purdue, but unfortunately I do not, but I have taken a lot of classes here. I've taken classes on time management, supervision, any computer class that I could based on when I could get away and do it. Mm-hmm. Um, Purdue used to offer to their staff uh, Word, Excel, publisher outlook training and um, I took all those classes was and participated in the accomplished clerical excellence program the ACE program and you have got a lot of training through that program as well back when I was hourly I've been administrative a really long time now but it, it was a springboard and helped me mm-hmm. and um, the professors and the teachers that I had were all great you know and I'm a, when I teach, I teach based on, you can only learn it if you do it yourself. So when I teach that, I usually have computers and I have people sit there and they do it. We also, and they do it themselves and I talk them through it. We also have technology where if they're in an office somewhere over in one of our residence halls and they need help right now, I can remote into their machine and and consult with them at that time. Yeah, I've had to do that in my office in residential. Yeah, it's big help. Support. Yeah, it's a big, big help. So, it's it's uh, you know it's been good to do that. Um, 
Are there any student traditions or customs that you remember or that have had an impact on you from your time in the class? Um, as far as traditions, the, in, during the 80s were the dinner dances, and they also had a lot of, um, which was cool, and they, they still do, but not as much. They used to have Halloween parties mm -hmm. for the children at Purdue Village, the family housing, and some of the local churches would publicize it, and their mm -hmm. kids could come, uh, and they would do that for Thanksgiving and Christmas. And I think those were times when the kids would come in when we were there that it was just wonderful to see this generation having fun with that generation. And I don't know if they do that as much anymore because, every, like you said earlier, everybody's so busy. Mm -hmm. I miss the homecoming parade with all the floats mm -hmm. and, and the uh, big guys that the halls would put out front, you know, all the big displays. Miss that a little bit. Um, I don't know if they do that as much either. Yeah, I don't. I don't think so. But I'm an old grad student. I <laughs> doesn't live on campus, so I'm yeah. kind of out of the loop. And, and I think if they do, it's just something little. But they used to be very competitive. And I think that's good. You know, you've got your students who are competitive in sports, but this gave students who weren't mm -hmm. an option to be competitive and win trophies. And if you go through some of our residence halls, they're proud of those trophies and they'll have them displayed, not just for Grand Prix or, or the rec sports that they do, recreational sports, but for those things. Mm -hmm. so. um, I know that you touched on this a little bit, but what do you think makes the residences at Purdue unique? I know in my own experience, where I did my undergrad, I was forced to live in a residence hall my first year, and I kind of did my time and got out as soon as I could. But I, I think had I gone to Purdue, I probably would have stayed the whole time. So what do you think makes the residence halls so unique and so appealing? Um, I, I think, you know, the students who live with us, even though they're busy today, have time, and this is just little things, if you're rushing out a door and it, there's a male student in front of you, they hold the door open for you. Um, they smile, they say hi, they're, they don't just look down at their iPhones, they're, they are looking up and, and they're talking to you. And just before I came in for this session, I saw someone out on the sidewalk that was a student walking by and uh, I figured she's probably working somewhere and she said, hi, how's your day going? You know, it's just the friendliness of the students and the fact that they not only are a, a quietly appreciative of the staff but they're vocally appreciative of the staff and they let people know and that means a lot and I see the staff who get recognized and it means a lot to them it really does to know that they aren't just a service person on the floor they become a surrogate mom or dad I think that's really nice. Um, so going back to your current position, what I'm sure that it varies from day to day, but what does a, a typical day look like? A typical day is um, writing reports uh, because it's a new system, so we're transitioning from the old and still don't have all the reports written. It's answering phone calls, emails, and IMs from staff who have questions and usually there's something to do with why is this not working or how do I find this or I think I might be the information hotline or something <laughs> for a lot of people. So it's doing that um, training. Training is a little bit heavier during the summer because we have some turnover in staff of people who go to other places to work. Um, coordinating a lot of processes, you know, documenting these processes. That's probably the biggest thing is anything that I'm doing, I'm right alongside documenting it so that if something happens to me, someone else knows where it's located and can do it. And if I um, was in another office, I'd probably be answering questions for them all day long because they, they get so many, but that's over in our housing, our main housing office, so. 
do you coordinate with ITAP a lot? I coordinate processes with them um, because John went that way and I'm over here in operations. We still technically do a lot of what we did together still. So yeah, I have, we, I've created a run calendar and John and I both uh, have, are in control of it. So that helps us know what we're supposed to do on a day-to-day -day or an annual basis. Um, we also, um, everything that we create we do backup documentation on it. So for the IT side, there's a lot of backup documentation. On the operational side, there's a lot of training material documentation or uh, coordinating um, tasks for the whole division, and that's usually a form of documentation. Now when you say John, is that John Wright? Richardson. Richardson. Okay. Yes. Yes. And he, he'd be someone to talk do too because he actually saw uh, he was over Hillenbrand Hall when it was being built and he's been in our system and been here as long as I have so he's seen a lot of changes too so what halls have you all been in you started in Owen started in Owen I moved to Earhart helped at Shreve um, when I left uh, I left there and went over to Smalley Center the director's mm -hmm. office when I left that and became full administrative, uh, I then was at, at the director's office for a while, had a satellite office in Hillenbrand, satellite office in Harrison, satellite office back at the director's office, well that wasn't satellite, but an office mm -hmm. back there, and then got moved here at, for, as a satellite office. I still work for them, but this setup is conducive for me training four to five people okay. without needing a lab. So basically, almost every call. <laughs> it just about it, yes. Because when I was at Owen, um, I helped out at Carrie and Tarkington when they needed help, and likewise they did for me. So yeah, it's just one big spider web here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what are some of your current interests? Current interests, well, it's family first and foremost, obviously. Um, and then secondly, I do like to learn more about the tech side, so I try to self-teach myself things on the side. I love to mow. <laughs> I don't know why, but I love to mow. And one thing, I don't really have like any hobbies or anything, but one thing that I'm extremely tender-hearted, and we've had a network of 12 squirrels <laughs> that come to our house every night for dinner, and I just love animals a lot. I dog and cat sit for some friends, and it gives me a, a pet fix. I mm -hmm. lost a couple of very dear pets, and I just can't do that again. Yeah. So, so I do love to dog and cat sit. So. And do you have kids? No, uh, we couldn't have kids, but we had five nephews and two nieces, and we always said because this was a basketball family, mm -hmm. we had enough for a team and two cheerleaders. <laughs> <laughs> They've all grown up, and now I have um, two, three great nephews, one great niece, and another great niece on the way. Wow. Yeah, all on my husband's side of the family because my brother has not married, and so it's it's been wonderful. Uh, to have all those kids around. Mm -hmm. Anyone a Purdue grad? Yes, uh, Chris Kanine is a Purdue grad. And uh, he used to come see Aunt Kim over at the director's office. And at that time, uh, there were seven of us women in that office. Um, and the minute Chris came in, he's, he's blonde haired, he would go immediately red because every woman went up to the counter and went, Kim, Chris is here, you know, and then he would start teasing him and then ask how he was doing, how were his classes, how was his room, they want to know everything. So, yeah, he really, he's still a diehard Purdue fan, too. Yeah. <laughs> so, Very nice. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's about all that I had on my list. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? No, I, I think that there's a lot of questions as far as the history and the, to think back on all the things that have changed. Mm -hmm. And when we got computers and everybody's so scared about that, it, it's just really great to have been a part of seeing every bit of that happen. Because until we got computers, you might go from a, eight track tape to a cassette player to 
you know, CDs, and now, you know, to be a part of every single change that all the students are a cha part of, the change, it's great. But it's old hat to them, it's new to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Well, thank you very much. For thank you. For participating. Thank you.